Welcome to BEFM Drama, where all this week we're bringing you the second half in our adaptation of A Study in Scarlet, the first Sherlock Holmes story. In this episode, we're deep in the backstory of Jefferson Hope, the man responsible for the murders that have fixated the attention of Holmes and Watson in London. Join me now as we return to a frontier community under the despotic leadership of a false prophet in the American West, where John Ferrier, the adopted father of Jefferson Hope's beloved Lucy, has just risked everything by refusing to give her up in marriage to the sons of the prophet's chosen elders. The morning after John Ferrier turned away the sons of Drebber and Stangerson from his daughter, he found his first warning. A small square piece of paper pinned to his pillow in the night with the number 29 written on it in large numerals. He felt his heart race when he saw it. The windows and doors had all been locked the night before and he hadn't heard a sound. He could not understand how the note had been spirited into his room, but he understood the meaning well enough. The next morning, a 28 appeared in charcoal on the ceiling of his kitchen. So the prophet had given him a month to decide the fate of his daughter, and he would have his month. Ferrier had sent a message to warn Jefferson Hope, but he could not know when or if he would receive it. He must wait. But what if he did not come? He dared not think what then. And so it went, day by day, counting down the days until the night that he set in desperate contemplation of the number two that had been scrawled on a wall of his house. Was there no escape from this invisible network of spies around him? Ferrier put his head in his hands and sobbed. Then he heard a noise. What was it? A gentle scratching in the silence that came from the door. Ferrier crept into the hall with his shotgun and listened intently. It was a very gentle tapping. Was it some midnight assassin come to carry out the murderous orders of the Prophet's secret tribunals? Springing forward, he drew the bolt and threw open the door. Outside, all was calm. Ferrier looked to his right and left, then happened to glance down at his own feet, where he saw to his astonishment, Jefferson Hope, lying flat on his face on the ground, with arms and legs all asprawl. Good God, how you scared me. Whatever made you come in like that? There are men watching around the house. Give me food. I haven't had a bite or a sip of water since I got your message two days ago. He flung himself upon the cold meat and bread which were still lying on the table for supper and devoured it voraciously. Then he turned to Ferrier. Does Lucy know the danger? No, but she suspects. The girl is no fool, and I have angered the prophet dearly. They're watching the house on every side. What must we do? We must run, tonight. I have a mule and two horses waiting in the ravine. How much money do you have? Two thousand dollars in gold, five in notes. That'll do. We'll head for Nevada, through the mountains. You must wake Lucy. While Ferrier woke Lucy, Hope prepared for the journey. He had hardly completed his task when the farmer returned with his daughter dressed and ready. The greeting between the lovers was warm, but short. There was a little time. We must make our start at once. The lights inside the house were all extinguished and from the darkened window, Ferrier peered out over the fields which had been his, knowing it was the last time. All looked peaceful and happy. Opening the window very slowly and carefully, they waited until a dark cloud had somewhat obscured the moon, then passed quickly together into the garden. They had just reached the first cornfield when Hope pushed his two companions to the ground. He'd heard a man standing in the darkness, watching the house. The Prophet's men have surrounded the house. Move silently and follow me. They slipped through the field and made their way from town. Jefferson Hope led the terrified farriers up a rugged and narrow path into the mountains, picking his way among the great boulders and dried up streams until he came to the secret place where his animals had been hidden. Lucy was placed on the mule and farrier upon one of the horses. Jefferson Hope led their way, and all night they fled the city of the Prophet. They made 30 miles by morning, but Jefferson was still fearful prophet would not take this insult quietly. They'll be on our track by now. Everything depends on our speed. By the end of the second day, the group had run out of the small quantity of food they had carried with them. Hope chose a hidden, sheltered spot where they set up camp and warmed themselves around the fire. I must leave you now to hunt. Will you be gone long? As short a time as I can. I'll come back for you, darling, with food enough to see us through to Carson City. We shall not part ways again on this journey. Hurry back now. I will. And, uh, Jefferson? Yes? Lucy and I have agreed. 
when we reach Carson City, you shall have her hand in marriage. I couldn't be prouder to have any other man as my son-in-law. Hope felt a lump in his throat and nodded curtly before he was turned away, lest the old farmer see the tears forming in his eyes. The last thing he saw was Lucy and John Ferrier smiling at him from beside the crackling fire. It was many hours before he was able to return to the place where he left the farriers. He could see no light from a fire, and he felt a chill in his heart that deepened each step he took toward the silent place he'd left his lover. He found the fire stamped out, spilt blood in the dust. He saw no sign of his horses or mule, but his eyes fell on something that made every nerve of his body tingle with terror. A low-lying heap of reddish earth next to the burnt-out fire. There was no mistaking it for anything but a newly dug grave. It was marked with a sheet of paper. The inscription was brief but to the point. John Ferrier, apostate, died August 4th, 1860. There was no sign of Lucy, and Hope knew that she'd been carried back by their pursuers to fulfill her destiny as a wife in the harem of an elder's son. As Hope realized the certainty of her fate and his powerlessness to save her, he wished that he too was lying dead with that old farmer in his final silent resting place. For five days, he walked back to the city of the prophet, where he learned that Lucy had been dragged back screaming in rage over the murder of her father and been forced to marry Elder Drepper's son, Enoch. Joseph Stangerson had shot John Ferrier. The light of hate burned in Joseph's soul. Enoch Drepper and Joseph Stangerson would pay for what they'd done. Lucy never spoke again. She refused food and water and died of defiance in weeks, leaving her captors nothing. Enoch Drepper cared little for her death, he had taken her solely for the sake of John Ferrier's property. But his wife sat up all night with her before the burial. Just before dawn, the door was flung open, and a savage-looking, weather-beaten man in tattered clothes stepped into the room. He walked up to the silent figure which had once been Lucy Ferrier. He pressed his lips to her cold forehead, and then, taking her hand, he slid the wedding ring from her finger. For some months, Jefferson Hope lingered among the mountains, nursing his fierce desire for vengeance. But he realized dying of hunger in the mountains was no use. Hope returned to his old Nevada mines. He intended to be gone a year at the most, raising money, but it was nearly five before he was free from the mine. His desire for revenge never wavered. Disguised, he returned to the Prophet's desert city, where he found that much had changed in the years he'd been away. Outraged at the oppression and brutality inflicted on them by the Prophet, his chosen people had risen up in arms. The Prophet and his senior elders, Stangerson and Drebber among them, had died in the streets at the hands of the mob. Enoch Drebber and Joseph Stangerson managed to escape, however, Enoch taking most of his fortune with him, while Stangerson was left nearly penniless. Hope traveled from town to town for years, a human bloodhound. In Cleveland, he at last found the men he pursued. By chance, however, Drebber, looking from a window, recognized him and saw the murder in his eyes. Drebber made a report to the police, and Hope was arrested for a time. When he was freed, he found Drebber's house was deserted and that he and his secretary, Stangerson, had departed for Europe. Hope scraped together the little he had and departed to follow them, tracking his enemies from city to city, but never quite catching them until finally they journeyed to London, where he at last succeeded. As to what happened in London, we can do no better than to hear it from Jefferson Hope's own lips, as duly recorded by the ever-reliable Dr. John Watson. Join us tomorrow as we return to our heroes in the streets of London 
in the riveting second to last episode of our production of A Study in Scarlet. From your host, Joshua Cornwell. Have a wonderful night.